Okay, so I think that we can start. My name is Oskar Dudic, and today I came to talk with you the history of the Project France, the worst event sourcing system. So this is me. I brought with me today this special award because we won with the Project France the title in the first annual context, uh, contest of, for the worst event sourcing system. <laughs> but what's the single man without the team? So let me introduce also other people that took part in that. So this is our development team. The Morris is a head of development, Roy head of operations, and Catherine is the head of product. And Michael is our CEO. Jordan is our head of sales and Donny head of compliance. And of course we had a uh, stream team, dedicated stream team, because we will be crossing a lot of streams. And of course, that's me. And because, as you will know in a minute, um, it appeared that to build the worst event sourcing system, you actually need to know how to build event sourcing systems. Because we wouldn't like to accidentally even create the system that would be good enough. Because for us, that wouldn't be a correct option. So. I'm one of the co-maintainers of the Martin, which is a .NET library that allows to use uh, Postgres as event store and document database. And I was also working with the first event store, so event store DB, uh, for some time. And I'm also currently a consultant where I'm not always teaching people how to build the worst event sourcing system. Sometimes I also teach them how to do it properly. But it depends on the needs of the client, of course. So. Um, to give you the example, because the, the measurement of the success, like if you are winning, is the quality of your competitors, right? So we also had competitors. Um, the small ones, the organized ones, the creative ones, the weird ones. <laughs> and we also had the competition from the biggest cloud providers. AWS tried to beat us. Uh, of course, Microsoft also wanted to do it. For some reason, Google did not. But I think that they were just reasonable because we, they already know that we will be hard to beat. So let's start with our first idea. So the, the idea that we came up. And we gathered together because each uh, project, even the worst one, needs to start from the whiteboard. We put a lot of sticky notes, we grouped together to discuss that. And eventually we came up with such architecture. Um, if you don't know this architecture, then that's good for you. But let me explain it. And one disclaimer, so I will use the George Orwell analogy. So what is bad for our project is actually good for uh, like a good practice in general. And what's good for our project is actually uh, bad practice. So this will be a bit of twist. But let's go to the, our first idea. So <clears throat> this architecture might be blurry enough, but so to make it a bit more clearer, then I blurred some of the stuff. So our intention was when we are getting requests from the API, then the first thing that we do, of course, we are loading data. And there is no surprise that we are loading this data from the database. But then we are running the business logic, validating, yada, yada. But it would be too simple if we store the result in the database, right? So we are storing that in a queue. And during the, the, um, this presentation, I will be using Kafka as an example. Because Kafka is pictured the most as the, the best, which is, uh, we'll see if it's the best option for event sourcing. But if I'm saying even uh, if I'm saying Kafka, then you can think the same that the same would apply to Event Bridge, Azure, Event Hubs, or any other messaging streaming solution. So again, instead of storing data in our database, we are immediately putting that into the queue. I'm almost sure that you saw that on the internet, right? Uh, because we inspired a lot by that. 
And then in, when we are storing this event, then at some point with the eventual consistency, we are getting with some delay uh, the event and we are handling it. And after that, we are finally storing the result in the database. And let's start with the best case scenario. So how it is pictured, like how it should work in general. So let's say that we were building the accounting system or like the bank account. And this scenario shows that at first we are recording one inflow and then we are trying to withdraw twice the same amount of money. So in the perfect scenario, so not perfect for us because that would mean that the system actually works and we, as I mentioned, we don't want that. So the perfect scenario is that we are getting the balance from the database then we are appending new events to, to our messaging system. And then the, the event is handled. We are updating our state in database. We have updated balance. That's fine. And then when we try to withdraw money, then we are doing the same, checking balance, uh, appending new event as a result, handling it, and finally updating database. Um, and in the end, so the, the, last, the, the last request should fail because we don't have any money in our account. So we are getting balance, it's zero, we can reject the request. But reality, luckily for us, uh, is a bit different. So let's say what can go wrong in this scenario. So I already mentioned eventual consistency and let's try to have a look how it can uh, get into this game. So we are re getting the first recording, uh, the inflow. Um, this works the same way, appending even, handling it, and uh, updating the balance. But if we are withdrawing the, f the first request, then of course we can withdraw the money, but in this case, we already might have the the delay between the event handler is getting the event and the, the another request is trying to run the business logic. So of course, in some systems, that's not an issue. Maybe in some criti not so critical or without a huge traffic that could work, but our system will be of course really high traffic, high resolution, high everything. So in that case, if we are trying to get the balance and the event handler didn't update the state in our database, then we are having the wrong state. So we, our business logic will be validated against the stale data. And that's the re as a result, we are appending the new event because the balance wasn't updated. And in the wrong, in, in, as a result, if we, with the delay, apply those two events, then we are getting eventual inconsistency. And that's perfectly fine for our case because uh, we want to have the system that looks like it's working, but in the critical uh, part, it won't be working. So let's check another case. So item potency. And item potency is a word that you better watch out when you are saying. But for some reason, we will have to say I, that our systems are item potent. And idempotency means that if we are handling a specific request twice, thrice, or m m m n times, then it doesn't matter how, ma how many times we will handle a specific request, we should get precisely the same result. So let's have a look on our scenario. So we are recording inflow, updating the balance, but in this case, our queues, so any queue, they have the retries mechanism. And those retries might happen for various reasons. Maybe our service was not available. Maybe the queue had some issue. Maybe we had some uh, temporary issue in our code. And then those messaging systems will try to redeliver the message. And once that happened, and if, if we didn't foresee that, then we might be handling that twice, thrice, or more times. So in this case, the first inflow would be handled twice. And instead of getting $100 on our balance, we are getting 200. And not surprisingly, if we try to handle those two other requests, then 
the second request won't be rejected because we are again getting the wrong state because we didn't assume that it might be the case. Of course, we could be uh, using some strategies about handling idempotency, but I can guarantee you that they are non-trivial. And in our system, so our uh, uh, project France, definitely we won't be using them. So we are getting idempotency. <laughs> And the third case that I wanted to explain you and show why we be believed that this strategy and this architecture is a great strategy for building the worst event sourcing system is the events ordering. So this is the department store. And if you have a look on those queues, and if I put those three people so you can try to guess which of them will be handled first. You, you don't know. Of course, the only thing about the queues in the department store and the only fact that always works is that the queue that we are standing is the slowest one, right? <laughs> but here, you can say that probably if someone is standing in the same queue, then you can guarantee that this, will be, uh, this person will be handled after the person that is storing, uh, standing up uh, in front of them. But besides different queues, you never know, because there can be like a change of cashier, the paper in the drawer may be finished, and so on and so forth. There are many scenarios. And that's the same case for our messaging systems. So if we have a look on like Kafka, then we have two splits. One is topic and the other one is the partition. And topic is a logical split, so we can think that our topic in this example could be department store. And partition could be each of the queues. And in Kafka, we only have the guarantee on the partition level, because this is the physical, how the data is laid out. But it's not only for Kafka. Any other queuing systems, like in Rabbit, you can also get the guarantee only for the specific queue, not between the other queues. And of course, that's not a rocket science. We can find a way how to, and find a strategy how to split our topics and, and partitions. Um, but that quite often is non-trivial. And of what I saw, many people forget about that. And they are not thinking about it, just using the default strategies. And of course, in the Project France, we also wanted to use those default strategies because why do we have those queues? Like in the department store, to make the processing faster, because this is the trade-off. We are trading off the, either like I mentioned, consistency or the ordering, because we want to move the data faster from one place to another. But if we don't know or don't care, so like we didn't care, then it actually can be really troublesome. An example of that is if we want to update the read model, then quite often those events can change the order. Like there are many cases, even in Kafka, like if you have the pre-flight messages and you, so that means that if you are appending events and you said that you, it will be caching like 10, 10 messages before putting that on disk, then it can get out of order because of the retries, et cetera. Or in the Rabbit MQ, I heard that the, a lot of people are having strategy that if they weren't able to process the message, then they are putting it back on the queue and then trying to play a roulette until they get the proper message. So the ordering might be broken. And in our case, that's perfect scenario for us because that's what we wanted to achieve. We wanted to ignore eventual consistency. We wanted to ignore the idempotency and the ordering. We, and as you see, if we first got that the bank account was opened, then that would work and then inflow recorded. But the reality is quite often that this guarantee might not be fulfilled. Like for example, if you have your strategy that uh, each topic is a different module in your services, then between the services, you cannot guarantee the order. And of course, we are getting the events uh, disordering which is what we wanted to achieve. Because that's cool, that's great, that's perfect case for us. And 
Of course, some say, and if you search for the internet, then you say like, yeah, okay, but you know, you are getting the extreme throughput, you get the high scalability, yada, yada. And that's fine because you can use the process managers and you can compensate each of the business operation. And that's also what we wanted to do because process managers and handling distributed processes is really needed. Eventual consistency is nothing to be scared of, but if each of the business operation needs to be handled like that, that you don't know whether your data is consistent because your stale state may be always stale and for each business operation you need to provide the compensation and then compensation for that compensation, then that creates some nightmares like on, you, you can see on the screen. But the worst thing that happened for us after one year of development is that Donny, and I mentioned you, the head of the compliance, called me and said like, hey, Oscar, we have a problem. And it appeared that to build the event sourcing system, you actually need to use event sourcing system. And what I just described is not event sourcing, it's event streaming. So the first thing was that, okay, that's bad. How are we gonna make and change the transition if we cannot use all of those anti-patterns that I described? But in the end, we thought that wasting one year for development can be like a bonus for, for us for getting the award. So that's fine. So we rolled up our sleeves and we decided that we will continue our effort. And so let's maybe discuss what's actually even sourcing. So event sourcing, in a nutshell, is a really simple pattern. So we have the event store, and event store is a, is a database, actually. And it's focused on the recording and handling our events and getting the granular information about what has happened in our business logic. So the first thing that we need to have is the command, so the request, the intention to do something. And that should be business meaningful, like be, withdraw cash from ATM. Because if we don't have this clear intention, then we won't know how to record the meaningful event. But essentially, that's still a, web, a request that will probably came through our web API, so no, nothing different from our regular approach. And the first difference that we have is that we are not getting the data from some cache, from some other database, because the only, day, the only state that we have in event sourcing are our events. So we are reading all the events for the specific stream. And the stream is like a representation of record. Once we got those events, then in memory, we are applying them one by one to get the current state or being precisely state at the certain point in time. And once we have it, then again, there is no difference to any handling of the business logic. We need to validate, we need to uh, run the business rules, et cetera. And the, other, uh, and the other difference is that as a result, we are not updating the state. We are just appending another event to the same stream that we got the events back. Because as I mentioned, events are our state. So this is a simple pattern. And that wasn't great for us, because if it's a simple pattern, then building the worst system can be really hard. But I already spoiled you the fun because we made it, right? So does that mean that we cannot use Kafka? Did someone lie in the internet? That's not possible, that's not happening, right? So let's think how this confusion came from. Because when we are descri describing event sourcing, then most of the resources are starting that event stores are up and only log. And hello, Kafka is an up and only log, right? That's correct. But, and essentially most of the implementations or event stores are up and only log. So in that case, people are not lying. But uh, the up and only log, if we have a look, then is representing a set of streams. 
And streams, as I mentioned, represent a specific record. So for instance, if we have multiple accounts, then each account will have its own stream. If we have order, shopping cart, um, whatever entity that we have in our system, it will be represented by the specific stream type and instance of that object will be represented as a specific stream. So we could have a look on our uh, event store as logically like a key value database where key is the record ID and the value is the sequence of events. And if we think about it like that, then it's much easier to reason what guarantee we can expect from, uh, from event store, because if it's a key value database, then we can expect the similar guarantee that we have from any other key value databases, right? And as I mentioned, one stream, one record, almost, most of the time. So maybe, we could use partitions from Kafka because it looks almost like a stream, right? So <clears throat> remember loading events. In Kafka, you are subscribing to events. You are not loading them. There is no API and in any other messaging system, actually, I didn't saw such API. Of course, you can do some tricks with, the, um, with, the, with your code and, and made some wrapper around subscription, but yeah, it's still the case. And this is the screen from the Kafka block, and it appeared that in Kafka in total, we can have 200 thousands of partitions. So if we try to put a, part, a stream as a partition, then how many records we could have in our system? 200 thousand, right? So usually people are putting like more than one record inside the partition to went through that because I, I'm sure that if you try to build like 200,000 partitions in Kafka, then it wouldn't be extremely performant. But then if you try to load that data from partition, then you would be loading not only your specific record, but the huge set of other records, right? So does anyone recognize that? What's that? Anyone is using databases here? Yeah, Dennis, what's that? Oh, I don't know the answer. <laughs> That's write a head log. Or if you're using MS SQL Server, this is the transaction log. And in the middle, in each database, relational database, even RavenDB that there is there, you can go them and there and ask them, is built like that. As a centerpiece of each database is the write ahead log or transaction log, which is the log of all operations that you have. So insert, update, delete. It's getting first into this append only log and then building the tables, updating, inserting data. So from the perspective of the database, like tables are read models actually. And we could build it in the same way. So even stores are also databases. So if they technically are right ahead log and you can put events one after another, then that doesn't mean that you, the logical split is different. So again, log, physical split, uh, streams, logical. And that's how, for example, even store DB is built. It just builds from scratch. You just stored, zeros and ones on the disk, like in any other databases. Or you might implement it like in Martin. So for example, keeping all the events in the specific uh, tables, because keeping data as for example, JSON B and other information as a regular columns, because all those me metadata will be the same for each of, of the event. And let's have a look on the last, um, and this time optimistic case, so optimistic concurrency. So the final piece of making sure that we are making decision based on the latest state. So optimistic concurrency works like that, and it's not only about event sourcing and event stores. I really encourage you to use it anywhere with any databases because any database can handle that. So it works like that. When we two requests that are happening in parallel, at first want to access the state, 
then they are getting also the version of the specific state. So in event sourcing, it could be like the number of events you have in stream. And then if you are sending that I want to append new event, then you can say that the version that I saw is version number three. And database can compare if it's the same as they have in database. And after that, uh, if those versions matches, then the save is made and the record, in this case, uh, event is appended. And then if someone tries to run after that and send that, I made my decision based on the version three, then database can say that, no, 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 the version now is four, so your save shouldn't be made. And actually, all of that, so atomicity, optimistic concurrency, reading your own rights, creates a rock solid solution. So in event sourcing and event stores, we get a sol really strong consistency on rights and all the guarantees. And can we do optimistic concurrency on Kafka? Maybe in the future, but <laughs> I know that the, the font is not great, so I will read priority, priority minor, Resolution unresolved, assignee unassigned, created in 2015, and last updated 2018. No, not a priority. And, but, pss, actually Kafka is okay. Is there anyone from Confluent here? No, then that means that I might be still a speaker on the Kafka Summit next month. <laughs> Because I really like Kafka, because it's a really good solution. And as I said, I'm using Kafka just to point because most often it's picture like, yeah, just use Kafka for event sourcing. Because Kafka is a good tool, even great tool, but for event streaming. And it also plays really well with event sourcing because we can put as the event source our event store, so database, and then forward and use Kafka as an integration between our services. So even sourcing is about recording and storing business facts and making decisions based on them. So about durability and the quality of your data. And even streaming is about moving data from one place to another. And that's the main difference. Even though all of that sounds similar, but really it's actually not. So, okay, I think that I bored you a bit with all those technical details. Then let's get Jordan. And as I said, Jordan, I told you that it's a head of sales, right? But actually it's our hype manager. As you can see, Jordan is able to deal really well with people. In Jordan, prepare the strategy for our product. Because you already know that building even sourcing system, you don't need to drop those guarantees like strong consistency. You can be still sure that you are making decision based on the latest state, which is challenging if you want to build the worst event sourcing system, right? Because it's actually not that simple as it seems. So we needed to do some tricks. So we wanted to build something like a Revolut because we wanted to have like the good matching of the domain just to show people that we care about that. We don't. And of course, we wanted to be kind of also like a Salesforce exposing APIs, API first, etc. And we also wanted to be like a Uber. But no, we, we don't want to run taxis, but we just want to be running our business for like 10 years and still not be profitable. <laughs> yeah, it's a good strategy for the worst system. And we also wanted to use all clouds, like all. If there is any new today, we will use it, right? Multi-cloud is the goal. And we also want to be on-premise. Because why not? Like I heard like DHH is saying that we should all be on premise, right? Then we will also be on premise. Why not? Why not? And we will also use blockchain. <laughs> blockchain? Um, sorry, that was our initial strategy. Gen AI. <laughs> <laughs> and all of that is creating a ticking bomb. 
And ticking bomb is something that we want to achieve because we want to get a lot of money. And thanks to this money, we can be cheating our stakeholders. Like, you know, we are really busy. We, need, we are building a serious product, serious architecture. When this will be ready? Soon, soon. And uh, of course, at some point, even the, the most polite, I wouldn't like to use other words, stakeholders would, would realize that we are cheating. So we need to do more. So this is Morris. As I mentioned, Morris is our head of development. And our strategy will be to build our own event store, right? Because that's what we are doing. If we are choosing new project and we want to build uh, a new project and use as a database, relational database, then we are saying, let's build new relational database, right? No? But for event store, that's a common case. And I even went to NDC Oslo two years ago. You can check that on internet. And I show you how to build event store in one hour. And actually most of that I built in the 25 minutes and then I was doing lame jokes that you heard today, right? <laughs> I mean, no, this was much more technical, but I just did a social proof, right? For our stakeholders. And so why is it building our own event store so hard? So let's say that, as I mentioned, we want to be um, multi-cloud and on-premise. Then that means that we need to support if either cloud native databases, which are quite often non-trivial. And we need to also support like, for example, Postgres or other database that we can run on premise. And we, of course, want to start because we are here in the NDC. So we start with the .NET technology. But we won't stop on that because we will also write our API to, uh, to support also Java and Node.js. But why? And because Michael told us that it will be much easier to get more people to build the event store because and handle and create our services. Because each service can be run in a different technology. It will be easier to hire. Maybe that's some strategy. Maybe not only for the worst event sourcing system, but that will actually mean that we will start with a simple event store, but we will need to maintain all the implementations for all those other services, right? And that's com quite common the case. And architecture, and that, that will be another question for you. I hope that this time there will be someone that knows the answer. So what's that? Uh, could you repeat? Onion. Onion? No, it's not an onion. I mean, it looks similar. It's Atlantis. <laughs> and Atlantis in the ancient Greece was pictured as the, the most sophisticated culture, the most innovative, like the, the best of the best of the technical solutions. And when I thought about that, when we were doing those workshops that I saw you at the beginning, then I thought like, hell, that looks like a clean architecture. So we decided that we will use the, the clean architecture because it looks like a maze. It looks like an onion. And do you know what, how Atlantis has finished its lifetime? <laughs> then he's told that he's never been there. He's not lying. And Atlantis sank into the ocean eventually. And that's perfect case for our scenario because we want our project to eventually sunk. But if they are here, like, are there any like a clean coders? Cool. Then Dennis could say like, yeah, we can use use cases, right? Because use cases will allow to focus on the domain, on the business, uh, etc. And if Dennis told that, but he didn't, <laughs> then he would be actually right. But show me the use cases on those screens. I just took it from one of the clean architecture code, like the picture 
Of course, you can implement clean architecture differently, but that's the most common case. Like you have the persistence and then you have like migrations, translators, and uh, infrastructure, uh, events, tracking, validation, yada, yada. So this is a perfect scenario for us because we want to make stuff complicated, mashed together, hard to maintain, and we want to be circling around. And CAP theorem, we also are aware of the CAP theorem because as I said, to make something worse, we need to be sure that accidentally we won't create the proper system, right? And the CAP theorem is saying that we cannot have the system that is both available and consistent. And also, we are also including the network partitioning, which means that we, are, we won't be losing data on the traffic. And I mentioned to you that we have the strong consistency in event sourcing. And we, can, we have optimistic concurrency. We, we know that if we are making decision, then we are making it based on the latest state. But that's not the case for actually for the read models, because quite often, in, not in all solutions, but for read models, we have this eventual consistency. And also for the communication between services, we have that, and that's fine. But we can do a, lot, a bit of magic to spoil that, as I mentioned. Eventual inconsistency, we can have events disordering, and we can have item notency when our business and read model can be broken. So that's good, that's good. And network partitioning, I already mentioned that we will be doing multi-cloud and on-premise. See how Roy is happy when he le learned that he will be needing to hosting that? And delivery guarantees, so exactly once delivery, like a holy grail, like all, all uh, solutions like Kafka, like uh, Pulsar, like any streaming solution is saying that if you publish message, then you will get it exactly once. But let's have a look how it is in reality. So if we are appending, like storing state, and at the same time trying to append new event, then it might be that we stored the data in database, and when we publish, then our service crashed, and no message will be sent. And then we are getting inconsistent state potentially. Then, even if we manage to send it, then our queue may crash. Like, actually, that happens, really. Uh, it might be the case that it didn't crash, but maybe retention policy just kicked in. Like the default uh, retention policy for messages in Kafka is, I think, two weeks. And then delivery might be crashed because our service might not be available. Maximum number of retries has been reached or any other reason, like even bug in our code. I mean, we don't do bugs, but we will in France, right? And then if, if we even get the message, then we might have an issue and don't store the message. So in, in, in general, getting at, at least once guarantee is really hard because of that. So because all of those cases in the meantime can just fail, which is good for us. So we could use Outbox pattern, but we won't. And let me tell you why. Because Outbox pattern means that um, you are storing in your database your state update together with the message in the same transaction. So either both state and message are stored at the same time or none of them. So when you store that into, for example, some table with the messages, or if you are using event sourcing, you just appended the event, then there is a, either some process that continuously try to pull new messages and forwards them, or you can use some CDC, so push-based notification and forward them. And all of those mess messaging systems have built-in retries, so they will be trying to continuously retry and reprocess that. But that creates the idempotency potency, because it's not that someone wants to spoil our system like we did in, fr in France, right? People build those retries to make the processing and ensuring that once you send the message that you will get it. But technically, that means that you want like the exactly once the delivery is impossible. Only at least once. Exactly once processing 
Yes, if you handle that on application side, which we don't intend to do. And so instead of CAP theorem, we will do the CRAP theorem, which means that we will ask our dev team to ensure that we have 100% consistency, 100% availability, and 100% uh, tolerance for network partitioning. I'm sure that some of you heard that words from your managers, right? I did. And speaking about the managers, so we already know that we can build a product model that won't help us to use event sourcing. We can use some strategies in architecture to make that harder, but that's not enough. So we wanted to do the product design. And unfortunately, the next obstacle to win the worst event sourcing uh, system title is that actually events are helping in your running your business process because those are screens from event storming, event modeling. Anyone is using that? Yeah, some of you. So for others, I really encourage that you to check that. I mean, at least if you don't want to build the worst system, right? Because those techniques are like we are grouping both business and technical people, and we are starting to think about the events, so critical parts of our system. Because, business, because events are technically both um, like showing the, um, what's happening in the business process, and they can also be mapped to the technical messages. So that helps to streamline discussion between business and technical people. But luckily, we have Catherine, because if we put the Catherine there, then she can derail those discussions, right? And we can have a skewed modeling. So for instance, we can use the pattern like CRUD sourcing. CRUD sourcing is like we are doing CRUD, but on events. So instead of having events like transaction initiated, payment method selected, payment confirmed, fraud transaction detected, we will be just storing transaction created, update, updated, deleted. So because of that, we will be losing one of the biggest benefits of event sourcing, so having the granular business information about the process, but flattening that to just understanding of created, updated, deleted, and then the subscriber will need to try to guess what has changed. The other pattern that we want to use is the other way around, so property sourcing. Instead of having a single event, like for example, user personal data, uh, update, uh, updated or refined, then we, for each of the property of this event, we will provide a dedicated event. So user first name updated, user last name updated, uh, user address change, user email change. You can imagine how the compli complexity or the, how complicated it will be to handle all of that because we will be adding a lot of such events. And the other anti-patterns that we want to use is passive-aggressive events. Did anyone of you heard that phrase like the, the trash bin is full? <laughs> or that the dishwasher has finished uh, cleaning? <laughs> None of you? Okay. I did. So passive-aggressive events is the pattern where we are changing we are ignoring that there are cases, valid cases, where we want to have the direct communication and tell someone to do something, or in our technical meaning, meaning, send a command, some intention to do something, and then someone can say like, not at the moment, I'm busy, just watching Netflix. Or in our case, it's really important in system to model the communication as it is in reality. So sometimes, of course, we should prefer events because they give us the loosely coupling potentially and, and so on and so forth. But sometimes it's really required to, to have a clear intention to do something. So instead of request, pay, uh, request payment command, we will be publishing like order confirmed and you just do whatever you want. So that creates an issue because then tracking what precisely has happened or what reaction we expect from, from other services will be much, much harder. 
and stream design. Stream design, as any other storage technique, because even sourcing in a nutshell is a storage technique, like relational databases, document approach, even sourcing is also storage technique. So if we, with the relational databases, we are normalizing data. Document approach, we are denormalizing. And in, in even sourcing, we, we need to have also our patterns. So the first one, and the, the, the thing that you, you, you usually learn at the end, while you should be doing that since the beginning, and we, of course, in France, we were telling that we learned that at the end, it, that, and that surprised us, is that the, having the clear distinction between the private and public events, or in other words, internal and external, or as DDD likes to phrase it, domain events and integration events. Why is it so important? Because let's say that we have those five services, so payments, configuration, reporting, anti-fraud detection, and notification. So if we have even sourcing in our payment module, then that means that all the other modules, if we just push all those events to the queue, then all the other modules will need to understand what all those granular events like transaction initiated, payment method selected, payment sent via gateway means, because they need to gather a bit of the information from each of those events to, to run the processing. And that creates a lot of coupling and also leaking abstraction. And if we even source everything, and we will be publishing all the events, all our granular business events outside without doing any other techniques, then that will create such a spider web. And this is not the place that you would like to be. It's called hell or distributed monolith. And I've been there, don't recommend that. So how to deal with that? It appears that most often those other modules don't care about our granular information. Who cares that someone selected uh, uh, the payment method if the transaction wasn't uh, completed? Most of the time they care about the critical parts of the business process. So then you can think about the internal events as those that should be understood inside our module and public events or external as understood in the global space. So instead of publishing all those granular events, we could potentially just publish payment completed or maybe some other checkpoint. Mapping be before we send it from the granular information and reaching them and sending like a summary event. But of course we won't be doing that. And let me tell you about the other thing, which is extremely important in event sourcing. And of course, we will be ignoring that. So long living streams. So usually when I'm trying to teach and I'm doing workshop or consultancy, then people are asking me, okay, but what about bank accounts? See how many uh, transactions you might have. I think that I calculated for one of my talk, like because I had my bank account created when I was 18 years old. So I could have, I didn't check that like 30,000 of transaction, if I had like three transaction per day, then that wouldn't be good if we need to read all those events. And Mikhail Shilkov did a thought experiment to show what's the impact of the length of the stream to the IO operation. So let's say that if we are reading one event, then it's one IO operation. If we are storing one event, then it's one IO operation again. So this is showing the line, how the time is passing. Like let's say every second we are appending new event, always to the empty stream. So this is the linear grow, it's all fine. So this is like one IO operation, zero for reads, one for writes. If we have stream with one event, then that means that we are doing one read and one write, which is two IOPS. For two events is three and so on and so forth. For 10, it will be like 10 IO operation and one for an additional for write. But if we accumulate how to get to the stream that have five events, then actually to get to that point, we need to do 20 IO operation. 
And for 10 events, it's 65. So as you see, it starts to escalate. And that's also visible on those diagrams. The blue line is for one event. And here, the green line is for 10 events. And it's still like a linear growth, a bit worse, but still sounds manageable. For 100 events, things start to escalate. And I will show you for 1,000 events. And you might not see that, but those previous lines are at the bottom. So that clearly says, I mean, event stores are doing better. It's not a real thing. Like this is like a real, each reading each event is like really one IO. They, they are optimized for that. But still, it clearly shows that the, length, the longer stream you have, the slower it gets. So no issue. We'll use snapshots. That's the most common answer for that. And of course, that's what we did, because that was good for our project, but not necessarily a good practice. And let me explain you why. Because if we try to do the snapshot after each event, so store our state somewhere else, then it means that we are potentially doubling the size. So if we start with that, then at some point we realize that, okay, that doesn't make much sense. Then let's try to do it every some period of time. And then we can read the snapshot and all the events that were appended after the snapshot was created. But how to define how often is enough? Like every 10 minutes, every day, every 10 events, every hour, or specific event type, I can tell you that you definitely will be wrong about how often is enough. And usually it means that uh, in the case, like for example, Break Fighter, if you are building a commerce platform, then, then you will have the most, the biggest number of events registered. And then everything will fail. So it is like a HDD pattern, which is like hope driven design because we are hoping that we will be right, but we won't at some point. Because snapshots are cache, and we all know that if you try to solve an issue with a cache, then you have two issues now, right? And that's what Roy told me, at least. So we could do closing the books, and closing the book means that we are, uh, instead of keeping a long stream, then we might realize that accounting doesn't work like that and we are having like a closing accounting mouth and opening a new one. So instead of keeping a long stream, we could keep and break it down into streams instead of account to accounting mouth. And then for each month, we will get another stream and make it more manageable. So see, this is like each stream would start with the accounting mouth open and all those that were closed with the accounting mouth closed. And that creates usually the, man the manageable size of the stream. But still, did anyone heard about closing the books? Not in the France project. So the final thing is that if that wouldn't be enough, then we just to double check, like to, to do this final touch, the chef kiss. We wanted to build the system to ensure that accidentally people won't find out how to do it right. Because unfortunately, people tend to do things right at some point, like they learn, they make it better. So we will create the system. So we will take experienced people, opinionated people, like rock style developers that are experienced, but not in those technologies. A bit similar, but they will like say like, hey, it just like, or why don't you do this one insert, right? And we were also inspired by William Deming. So um, that means that a bad system will beat a good person every time. And that's what we're gonna do. And we also inspired by the Conway law. So we will do use Conway law to, to make our system worse because we will create organization that will impact in, and create the worst architecture also. So right now, they are really popular, the team topologies. So of course, we will use them, but in the skewed perspective. So we will create the stream aligned team that is so cross-functional that they, don't, they are not good at anything. We will create the enabling team 
So the team that Infuria should enable, but they will be like, yeah, we are core team, we are busy doing our core stuff, right? And complicated subsystem team, most of our teams will be complicated subsystem teams because as you know, it's complicated. And the platform team, of course. And we will use Safa, which is great because at the beginning, when I saw this picture of Safa, then I said like, well, that's a great joke. Someone make a pastiche of the Agile. And then I realized that this is real thing. So we use it. <laughs> and of course we will use Jira and we will use the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We will just use all the best management strategies. And won't people quit? Well, we will use also Peter principle, which means that you are getting in the higher rank until you are reaching the, your, the highest level of incompetence. So our old people will reach that level. We will be, if they were complaining, then we will move them up, etc., until they realize that they are incompetent and better be quiet. <laughs> and we keep them busy. In Poland, we are saying that you are running with an empty barrel. So that's what we're gonna do. Remember, we will build our own event store. We will use clean architecture and we will pay them a lot because Jordan will handle that, right? And we will let them play with the fancy technology stack, solve those developer Sudoku, et cetera, every day without solving the real case. And what if all of that won't be enough? Any other ideas? We will hire a consultant. <laughs> and thank you. That's all. So if you scan this QR code, there will be a link to my article, which is like much shortened and uh, with uh, less uh, lame jokes uh, that you can also read and maybe share with your colleagues. And I'm here the whole day, also tomorrow, so don't be shy to uh, go to me and, uh, and talk. I'm really happy to discuss that, not only how to build the worst, but also like how to build a good one. Yes, Marco? Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> God damn it. That will be for the next edition. <laughs> Thank you.